Admiral Cressy, we are so honored to have you here with us today. And I'd like to turn it over to you for some opening comments, and then we'll go to questions from our panel and audience. Welcome. Well, thank you, Kathy, very much. Um, it is an honor to be with all of you and uh, participate in your very important mission. Um, and as you can see uh, by my face, the picture you had was about 30 years ago. I'm now a very old man. I look a lot like the George Washington that's right behind you. Um, but I'm delighted to be here. And I think it's, it's useful with the group that we're speaking to to start by saying George Washington did not always look like he does on the dollar bill. Uh, he was a very aggressive young man, made a lot of mistakes early on. But a part of his leadership was that he was very ambitious and was serious about making himself from the early age a better person and a more educated person. Now it's well, well worth remembering, his father died when he was 11. His brothers had been educated in Europe. His mother could not afford to send him. His formal education is over by the age of 14. And yet, by the age of 17, he had taught himself to be a surveyor. He had taught himself trigonometry and solid geometry. Now, between the ages of 14 and 17, uh, I was lucky if I could teach myself to hit a baseball. Um, he was remarkable because he was a big athletic kid. He ends up getting an early job and he goes surveying in the West. That begins his leadership because he understands that America is not just the seacoast. And many of the founding fathers only knew the Eastern seaboard of, of the United States. And Washington's early education gives him this great expansive understanding of what the of what United States could be. Makes many mistakes as a young person. But what made him a great leader in the long run is that he learned from these mistakes. Rarely, if ever, did he make the same mistake twice. For instance, when we look at the Second Battle of Trenton, remember, everybody knows the first battle he crosses the Delaware. Christmas Eve, tax the Hessians in, Chris, in Trenton on Christmas Day. But one of the big battles was Trenton too, when he lures the British down to a very important interjunction between the Delaware River and a, and a major creek. And after bloodying their nose several times, he makes the decision to retreat in the dark of night and go up and capture Princeton, capture the stores there and hightail it to the highlands of New Jersey for the winter. And what he said to his staff was, I made a mistake when I was young and I cost the lives of many young men that should not have died. I'm not gonna make that same mistake a second time. So despite his ambition, he has the humility and the humbleness to continue to learn and to reflect on what he needs to be, to be better. Now, key to any good leader is the capacity, obviously, to communicate, to collaborate, and to be civil. And throughout his life, Washington demonstrates, despite his aggressiveness, that he learns to listen. And we see during the war what a great job he does in listening to his staff. For instance, that decision to leave Trenton too and retreat up a back road to Princeton was not his idea. It was the idea of a number member of his staff, but he accepted that. And despite his great stature, uh, he really, he carefully listened. This whole business of collaboration becomes extremely important uh, throughout the war because he had to bring so many factions together. So a critical part of leadership, and look, I think every young person in school today knows that we're all members of a group, right? We're all, we're all, whether we have a specific task or we're just friends, but we have to learn to get along with each other. And those same fundamental things that we learn as kids carry on into adult life in an even more serious way. And he learns that not everybody's perfect, and he has to use people who aren't perfect. He has to be willing to delegate. And a key part of leadership is to trust those around you. 
and to have that capacity uh, to delegate important tasks to them by giving them guidance. Now, how does he do this? One of the things that makes Washington very special and is absolutely crucial to his form of leadership. Now, don't be afraid of this word strategy, but Washington has a very clear strategic vision when he begins to, to be the commander in chief during the Revolutionary War. And he always has that vision guide him in the way he leads and manages. Now, let me give you two examples. His vision, clearly, from the beginning, and it's fundamental to our Constitution at this day, was to win the war, of course, but to end the, to, to fight the war and to end the war with the united country. He recognized that if we were not united, we could never stand. And that theme came right out from Benjamin Franklin, but it was one that he totally adopted. Otherwise, the Spanish would have, would have in, in Florida, would have peeled off Virginia, or would have peeled off Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. The Canadians, the British to the North, would have peeled off um, New England. So he understands this. But even more important, he recognizes that if we're going to win the war and establish a democracy, he must establish the rule of civilian law. Think of this. How many of you in your history books can remember great generals who gave up power after they won the revolution, right? Cromwell in England did not. Napoleon did not. Lenin did not. Castro did not. You can go on and on. Washington is the only one in modern age. Now, the few of you who are history buffs going all the way back to Rome, or perhaps come from Ohio and celebrate the name of Cincinnati in the great city of Cincinnati would recognize that's the last great general I can think of who gave up power and went home. The end of the war, Washington turns in his sword, turns in his commission and goes home and says, I'm not coming back. He only comes back when he's begged to come back to go to the Constitutional Convention. And we'll return to that in a moment. But throughout the war, he fights the war, always deferring to the Continental Congress. Now, this is unfortunate, actually, because the Continental Congress has no executive power. All the executive power resides with the, with the individual gov governors of the individual states. So he is constantly referring to them. And even when his officers push him, encourage him to, to pressure Congress in untoward ways, he refuses to do so right up to the end of the war. He always defers to them. And so he establishes his leadership style is to, is to actually walk the talk, as we say. Very much follows in a very honorable way all of the things which he speaks about. Now this translates throughout the Constitutional Convention and all the way in to the opening of his presidency. Now, we don't study the development of the Constitution enough. The four year period between the end of the war, 1783, and the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787 are desperate days. America's splitting apart. America has, a, has massive inflation. Every state has its own monetary system. Now, Washington knows from having been the commander in chief of the army that we have to have a more balanced form of government. We've got to have a strong federal government. We've got to have checks and balances. We have to have a Congress that works. We have to have a judiciary system that works. All of these things are absolutely essential to the formation and the ongoing strength of a constitutional form of government. They beg him to come back. And finally, in 1787, he agrees to come back. Now, here's a key thing. He knows that at this point, he recognizes that everything he does will set a precedent. He's very perceptive. So one of the important things of leadership is to be perceptive, not just about the big issues that face us in the world, but about the everyday people that we work with that we're trying to lead. 
What's bothering them? What's of concern to them? How can we be more humane? How can we focus on their needs? A leader who understands the people he or she is leading is much more likely to succeed than one who doesn't. We really call that situational leadership. In Washington, and I wouldn't say he invented it, but he was certainly one of the early practitioners, even though it wasn't even written about until in the 1970s. So what does he do during the Constitutional Convention? He speaks only three times. He opens it, he closes the convention, and he speaks once on the whole notion of proportionality. That's it. He does all of his lobbying behind closed doors at night. He does not want to dominate the proceedings. He wants each state to be able to come together. So we can see him change his, his style from being an aggressive military officer to being beginning the process of leading a country, of being of which would eventually become president. Now, this is important because the body that forms the Constitutional Convention assumes he'll be president of the convention, and they assume that he'll be the first president of the United States. Now, although he doesn't want to be there, he understood he's going to have to do it. So he is very, very careful, very careful not to assume too much power. Now, think of this. Article one of the Constitution is all about the legislative branch. Every state had a state legislature. People know about that. It was very thorough. It clearly defined the laws and the rules of the Congress. Article two, the executive branch is very short, very brief. And, and Justice Kennedy of the Supreme Court used to say it was all because they trusted George Washington. They knew they didn't know a lot about what the executive branch should be. So they understood this. Now, the third thing was to, of course, establish the judiciary and then all the other pieces. What don't they get done? They don't get a Bill of Rights done, but they trust George Washington. And under him, they trust James Madison, who really is the father of the Constitution, as you all know. They send him home, go home, ratify the Constitution, come back, and the first Congress of the United States will pass a Bill of Rights. Now, that's a great leap of faith. The last constitutional amendment that we passed in the United States took 25 years. Imagine what it would take to pass 10 amendments today. 250 years? I, I say that humorously, but, but it might have. And it's an extraordinary reflection on the fact that they trust George Washington. Leaders need to be trusted. So all of us who want to lead have to earn trust. How do we earn trust? We earn trust by being open. We earn trust by being clear. Uh, we earn trust by being honest, by maintaining integrity. Now, the old story of the cherry tree is not true. But what is true is that Washington's integrity was simply extraordinary. Now, this leadership extends to his first term as president. He felt that if we did not pay our debts to the Dutch and the French, that our country would have no integrity. We would never be able to trade with other nations. And he insisted that we do that. Now, here's where he delegates. He delegates, he delegates to Alexander Hamilton. Let's have a national bank. Others in the country were afraid of a national bank. They were afraid of a strong federal government. Jefferson tended to be that way. And yet when Jefferson was president, he was a very strong federal president. So once you're in power, you recognize that you've got to have the authority to get things done. Otherwise, guess what? The roads don't get paved. The ambulances don't get out of the emergency uh, stalls. Everything has to happen, has to get done. Washington recognizes this at both the big picture and the small picture. He delegates. But now in order to get the job done, this is an incredible part of collaboration and leadership. He creates compromise. He encourages Jefferson to have a dinner with Madison and Hamilton. Now, all of you who've seen the play Hamilton 
will know what I'm leading to. And that is where Hamilton agrees to give the votes to Madison to establish the capital of the country in the South, satisfying the Southern tier of the United States. And the South agrees to give the votes to Hamilton and Washington for a national bank. So you can see through all four phases of Washington's life, as a youth, as a farmer, as the commander in chief of the army, at the Constitutional Convention, and finally as president. His ability to communicate, to be trusted, his credibility, his capacity to encourage collaboration, and his capacity to insist on civility. And I would end on that note, Kathy, that Washington had a great fear of political parties. And even throughout the Constitutional Convention, he required himself and everybody else to be civil. We don't get anywhere in this country by yelling at each other. And modern politicians need to be reminded of that fact. We need to treat each other with respect so that we can move this great nation forward through times of great crisis and peril as we've just gone through. I'll stop there. Well, that was just such a great presentation. Thank you so much, Admiral Cressy. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, what I took away from that, for one, many, many things, and I'm going to turn it over to Janine in just a minute for questions, but the three C's, communication, collaborate, and civility. And that's a great way to remember it. And thank you so much. Um, Janine, I know George Washington is one of your favorite presidents, and you've I'm sure you've got some questions. Yes, thank you. That, that truly uh, was very enlightening. Admiral, thank you so much. And um, gosh, he truly is the indispensable man and uh, to our country. And we can thank John Adams for a lot of that because um, John Adams is the one who, who insisted on the, uh, the movement for the Declaration of Independence. But also he's the one who thought George Washington he appointed George Washington uh, to be nominated for to to for for general, and he they wanted uh, John Adams to write the Declaration of Independence, but he said no, let Thomas Jefferson do it. So there there sort of was a a consensus of collaboration, but also delegation, which um, and 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 I think interestingly enough, uh, a lack of ego for the better cause, um, and. How would you feel that George Washington would cope with today's society? And I was thinking about the leadership then and the leadership now. And it's if no one has really any courage because they're too worried about who wants to take them down on social media. You know? <laughs> um, and And so people have somehow lost their their compass to just own and do what's right. And I would love to hear about a modern day George Washington in this environment. Um, I remember I asked my father when I was eight years old, father, dad, dad, if our founding fathers were to come back today, what would they be most disappointed about? And I think about that all the time. <laughs> I don't know why I was thinking about that as an eight year old, but here we are with constituting America. Um, but my father looked at me for a long time. He was a West Pointer graduate from West Point. And he looked down and said, taxes, <laughs> which was, I've never forgotten his answer. But what would our, what would George Washington, how would he handle the, the sign of the endless 24 hour news cycle and social media today? And that will just be my primary question. So we can toss it to everybody else today. Well, you've raised a very important question and it is a very difficult one. Washington, of course, had no inkling of social media, but he understood media. And there are some, he was very disappointed, frankly, was, was very hurt toward the end of his first term as president, where he was getting blasted by some newspapers that were accusing him of wanting him, of wanting to be king. And that was the last thing he wanted. He wanted to go home. He, he, he had no interest in being president, but no, he had to do it. And he did a very good job with it. Set all those important precedents 
conducted himself very carefully, traveled the entire country. Many people have forgotten that. He was in his late 50s, which was an old man at that time. He had very bad arthritis and rheumatism. But getting in a coach and driving over those roads was very hard. But he went all around the country uh, making the effort to let people understand that we had to be a united country. Almost everywhere he went, he received adulation, absolute adulation. But even then, newspapers would, would take a shot at him. And he found it very difficult, as strong as he was. I think all politicians find that difficult. And they, and they should, I mean, particularly the personal attacks. Social media is something, it is in a way, in terms of politics, is a bit of a crisis. Because we take every wart on any human being and we magnify it into some great sin. Um, you can't hide. Uh, and no one is perfect. So there, we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with all of this. And I think the likely outcome in a couple of years is that people may ignore a lot of what's on social media. I hope so, because there's no way social media will go away. I mean, uh, clearly, as they say, that cat is out of the bag. Um, but it's going to require it's a lot more than courage that's required. It is, we've got to have leaders from all over the country recognize that it's always gonna be difficult to run for office. Um, and we're gonna have to figure out a way in this country to be more civil to each other. I hope that will happen. Yeah, it's, it's a hard answer. And what I, what I find with social media is it's, it's just a small sliver of people making a lot of noise. Um, and what, if you get out into the country and see what the rest of the country is actually saying or doing, they, they really don't feel that way. And they're, they're much more considerate of each other and, and really much more independent minded. It's just these radicals, you know, that stir up things and make everybody it's uh, I can't even imagine that the courageous decisions that were made back then could be made today because it's um, everyone's just social media has become such a, a quagmire uh, of fear for everyone. But wouldn't we love it if George Washington could be here today? <laughs> How great if he could just step down and step in and walk into Congress and the White House. It would be pretty amazing. Anyway, thank you. And I'm going to toss it to Tova now. Well, thank you so much for being on and for uh, telling us about this man and you know all of his accomplishments. Um, I was curious about actually a more personal question on you know how were you first drawn to George Washington and what led you to take on your current role. Say that again. I missed part of that question. Yeah. What what drew you to learning about George Washington and and what led you to take on your current role educating others about him. This is almost funny. Um, when I was at the Distilled Spirits Council, we got a call from Mount Vernon asking if we would be interested in restoring George Washington's distillery. And the reason they wanted to restore George Washington's distillery was to show that he was a human being, that he was an entrepreneur. He had a grist mill that didn't excite people too much. He had a he had a barn for thrashing wheat. That didn't excite people too much. But they thought that people might be quite curious about the fact that he actually made whiskey. And of course, we, we did. We restored George Washington's distillery with the proviso that we could uh, publish his, his often remarks to the army that um, everybody, everything should, should be in moderation. So we agreed to do it and then we got into establishing a um a fundraiser on an annual basis and i gradually got more and more interested in george washington i i had been a history major at yale i know you were at harvard i apologize for that but um so i i had a lot of interest in washington lincoln both the roosevelts and a non-american churchill who i've always been fascinated by. So a natural, he was such an interesting leader. 
But as I've had a chance to read more and more, to recognize, as, um, as Kathy Gillespie said, the indispensable man, that, that, that extraordinary individual who could stay the line during the hardest of times um, and really uh, follow the strategic vision. I mean, that ability to give up power says an enormous amount about anybody. I mean, that is a very, very, very hard thing to do. That's, so it is interesting and it goes back in time that I had interest, but it, more recently it was for a very practical reason that I got involved with Mount Vernon. And I've been involved with Mount Vernon now for about 22 years. Great, thank you. Um, and then I was wondering, um, back to George Washington, uh, what, how do you think his military experience and his experience you know, running the American army influenced the way he later ran the country? And do you think it would have been different if we'd had a like civilian leader for our first president? Well, that is a good, that's a very good question. And it's, and it's absolutely applicable to the way Washington took on as chief executive, as president. One of the things that was so difficult for him was to literally see his troops starve because the Continental Congress had no executive power. So the ability to tax was left with the states. All the Continental Congress could do was to ask the individual states to send money, to send cattle, to send leather, to send wagons, to send horses, whatever it was. And that's not a very efficient way to run a war. You've got the British chasing you down through New Jersey and you're begging the Continental Congress to give you the arms you need, the men you need in order to do it. So he was so frustrated by that experience that he recognized that we had to have a strong executive. He was also, as we mentioned before, a very good listener and a very good collaborator. So remember now, he was a member of the House of Burgess in, in Virginia, I think for 19 years, I believe in total. So he had learned a lot about the legislative process. Now he would say himself, he wasn't necessarily a great legislator. Um, he wasn't a big orator, he was more a man of action. Um, but he understood and appreciated the Continental Congress. And he recognized that in any congressional de democracy de debate, it's gonna take patience, it's gonna take time. There's that wonderful letter that he reads from Congressman Andrew Jones uh, during that very scary, almost mutiny at Newburgh at the end of the war. And he pulls out this letter when he's telling the telling his officers that they must hold to the notion of civilian rule. And the letter from Congressman Andrew Jones says, in a democracy, we must allow and have patience for the time it takes to bring everyone together to build that consensus. So he understood that. On the other hand, he had the courage to tell Congress when he was gonna take charge of something and when he wasn't. Remember, there was no official cabinet. There were positions. He built the whole notion of a cabinet. I'll stop there. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, and then I also wanted to know, you know, what initially drew Washington into the American movement for independence? Like what, what was appealing about that to him and how did he sort of develop his um, political awareness that led him to, to lead this new country? It's very interesting. A lot of people, you know, if you think about the way the revolution started, and if those of you that are into it, I have to give Harvard a lot of credit for this. If you haven't read Stacy Schiff's book uh, called The Revolutionary, which is about Samuel Adams, I highly recommend it to you. In his, in his senior dissertation, as they were called in those days, and about, um, 1740, I believe, at, at Harvard. He wrote about the liberties of man. He began and formed later on these committees of information, very smart. He got rid of the term sons of liberty, which he thought would sound too challenging to the British parliament and to the king, called them committees of information. These committees of information spread all over the country. 
And they talked a lot about how these various taxes, whether it was you know, the Townsend Act or the Stamp Act or whatever it was, um, how they were really an infringement on liberty because we were not being treated as equal citizens with those who lived in England. And at least according to parliamentary doctrine, we were supposed to be. Now there was a royal appointed governor, as you well know, but we were electing our own legislative people and yet they were being ignored in the process. So Washington in the House of Burgess begins to feel this and begins to see this in action. But there's another little piece. He wants to be a British officer and he's, he, the British won't accept him as an officer. He always was considered to be a militia officer. So even as a young man, right? He gets a militia commission from the governor of Virginia, and yet he wants to have that commission in the British Army. He's denied that, and he begins to see that we're being treated unequally with those who are in England. So there's a little personal edge there, I think, that people sometimes forget. But I think most importantly is to recognize that while he's in the, the House of Burgess, and then later on, there are a group of people in Northern Virginia, a person that's often forgotten, George Mason. And George Mason, with some assistance from Washington, actually writes the so-called Fairfax Declaration, which I believe was 1772, somewhere uh, around there, in which they start to talk about the rights of British subjects in America. So that's really how he gets this sense and finally, after the Stamp Act and the Townsend Act and all those things, and hearing from people like Sam Adams, he concludes, along with many other Americans, that the only way is to become independent. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll pass on uh, to Jewel and Jordan, but I wanted to say, you know, it's fascinating to learn about George Washington. And um, I'm a tour guide at Harvard. And on campus, we have Wadsworth House, where George Washington lived. Um, at Harvard and uh, we have like Massachusetts Hall where like John Adams, um, Samuel Adams and John Hancock all lived. So it's like really incredible to be able to like live among history and, and just be able to feel some sort of connection to that um, and, and to see the continuity of that in the next generation. So thank you so much for being on and, and passing on your knowledge. Thanks for good questions. Yeah, we hope to build off uh, the great questions from Tova, and we're loving to hear about uh, George Washington's life and story in a way that you don't get to from the history books. I never knew so much of what you said already. Um, could you tell us um, some about George Washington as a general in the Continental Army? What were, do you know of some of his greatest successes or maybe what which battle he pulled off maybe the greatest decision or maneuver and then maybe one of his biggest failures which you kind of touched on before yeah um and you know that that's that's important because if we were to rate him as a battlefield technic tactician now granted he didn't have a bunch of battlefield leaders that he could depend on, right? He didn't have brigadier generals and colonels who had a lot of experience. With the exception of a few foreigners that joined us and a couple of others, he had very few people that he could depend upon. So let's start with that. So I think early on, you remember now they leave Boston after the British leave Boston, go back to, New go back to Nova Scotia for the winter to wait for that big armada to come in from England. So let's go back in time. July 4th, 1776 in the streets of New York City. Huzzah, huzzah, Declaration of Independence. Isn't this wonderful? Big party, everybody, drums beating, everybody joins the militia. Not so fast. Less than two months later, the British come with a hundred ships. Now, I always like to tell people that, because of course I'm an old admiral, that the most important service is the United States Navy. But the truth was an army couldn't function very well without naval superiority, right? Because 
you had to control the coastlines. That was the waterway. There weren't roads, there weren't highways. What roads there were were dirt, it took forever to get across. The waterways were important. So here come the British, 100 ships, 25,000 trained crack troops. Amazing. Washington probably spent too long trying to defend New York City. And they didn't have, even though he had established good intelligence, they didn't have enough to recognize how quickly the British could outflank them. So if you think of going from Staten Island to Governor's Island to Long Island, up through Brooklyn at Red Hook, up through Manhattan, chasing Washington, they surrounded Fort Washington. They should never have. Nathaniel Green was one of the big mistakes of Nathaniel Green's life was he said we could defend, defend Fort Washington. You couldn't because the British could bring 10 ships and just bombard it. So there was no way they could do it. Washington goes far north and then crosses the Hudson up about White Plains. I would say, some would say that was perhaps his biggest failure. Now, there are a lot of circumstances. The Congress had said, you've got to try to defend New York City. Now, in a serious war, you would have evacuated everybody from New York City and you'd have burned it to the ground so that the British didn't have anything to get because the British were going to get it. And they did. And so they had a base that separated New England from New York and the rest of the country, right? So, but what now Washington really gets smart as he's retreating down through New Jersey, fighting a rear guard action, he writes a letter to John Hancock. Now, not, not the famous insurance agent, right? But the first president of the, con of the Continental, con Continental Congress and says, dear President Hancock, we cannot win this war in one big battle. We cannot win this war in a few months. It's gonna take years. What we have on our side is time and space. And if we keep retreating and fighting, retreating and fighting, training, fighting, retreating, training, fighting, retreating, we will eventually wear the British down. Washington's greatest strength is his strategic sense. He understands the land. He's a farmer. He's been a surveyor. He knows we have the size of this country. Uh -huh. 25,000 troops is nothing in one state, let alone in 13 colonies, right? It's nothing. So the British were able to control cities. They couldn't control the countryside. Washington recognized that. Now, here's the second piece that I think is where Washington begins to show real brilliance. We like to talk about Washington's strategic patience, but you must you must tie to strategic patience, strategic agility. Now, now you people know in, in the, the good work you do in the music area, there are a lot of things you have to be patient about. But when you get that terrific opportunity to get before a great audience in a shorter time than you expected, you take it because you say, we can all come together. We can get in there. This is gonna be great. Let's do it. Well, here's Washington now, right? Big celebration. July 4th, 1776, and now it's December 24th, 1776. He's gone from 17,500 troops to about 3,500, and then there's an addition of some militia that come in, maybe 7,000 in total, and he sees this group of Hessians who are isolated, about 1,000 of them in Trenton. And he says, we've got to have a victory before the winter or the people won't have the confidence and the courage to stay with us. Strategic agility. And he, he does a terrific job planning and logistics. Go back to delegation. He has a guy named Glover, Colonel Glover, who was a sailor, who was a fisherman from Gloucester, new ships. He said, get every ship you can, get every boat you can, and we're gonna take barges and boats, move the cannon, the horses, and all of us, we're gonna cross the Delaware in three different places, and we're going to attack on a surprise attack on Christmas Day. They pulled it off. He showed persistence, didn't go as planned. Things never go as planned. 
didn't go as planned. He said, we're going to go forward. We're going to do this. And then having captured that first one, he said, now we've got to bloody their nose again at Trenton too. And then here comes his sense of risk aversion. He says, okay, as I said in my opening remarks, we're going to retreat to Princeton. We'll capture that. Now we'll have the whole winter in which to recover. We can start to train. So I think you begin to see some success. Now you go back and you look at things like Brandywine and some of the other battles that started off well, but he didn't have really good generals yet who were well-trained, who could attack in the right way. Now, later in the war, he was able to send people like Nathaniel Green to North Carolina and South Carolina. The British had gone too far from their lifeline, the British Navy. They went inland. And they started to run in to General Nathaniel Green, to Marion the Swamp Fox, and of course, two other generals, General Yellow Fever and General Malaria were taking their toll. So now Washington has divided up his army. He's got some leaders. And then he has that ability to collaborate with the French. And that's when they did the famous march around New York instead of attacking in New York. In 1781, they go all the way to Yorktown, Virginia, capture the British, and that begins begins to bring the war to an end. Wow, man. Talk about painting the picture. You're definitely a great guy to listen to. Um, I, uh, I'm a little curious about Washington's family. So you had mentioned that he had siblings that were older than him uh, that were educated. What ever happened to them when he left to be a surveyor? Well, this is interesting because in those days, of course, the eldest son inherited, right? So the eldest son inherited Mount Vernon. And he was a hero to George Washington. And um, he developed, unfortunately, tuberculosis. And George Washington went with him on a ship to Barbados to see if that would cure him. And of course, it did not. Now, interestingly, while George Washington was in Barbados, he caught a mild case of smallpox. So now he's immune. Now, throughout the war, he can be a little freer to do the things he, he needs to do. So both brothers die and Washington inherits Mount Vernon. Now Washington keeps trying to go out, keeps trying to get that commission I talked about before to fight He's fighting in the French and Indian Wars, does a couple of things very well and a couple of things not very well. Finally, at about the age of 27, 28, he says, you know what, I better settle down. Well, as luck would have it, unfortunately, I suppose, um, uh, Mrs. Washington, who was then known as Marcia, Martha Custis, her husband had died and had left 4,000 acres of land and a nice big trust fund. And in those days, it was important for a widow to remarry. Um, they needed a, yeah, but, you know, it was important to have a father, but it was important to have a male who could help run the plantations and all that kind of stuff. And Washington courted her. They developed a true romance. They actually had a very happy marriage. Now, unfortunately for Washington, but maybe good for the country, Washington was unable to have children. Martha never bore him a child. She had two of her own, and he treated them like his own. And he loved the grandchildren when they came. He doted on kids. Um, I'll say he was a very good farmer, very scientific farmer. Part of the way in which he was such a good military person was he was a cute observer of weather. He was a cute observer of his, of his workers, um, took good care of them. Uh, delegated things uh, throughout uh, the, the the farm, uh, worked hard on that stuff, um, and, that? and became a lifelong reader. One What's of the, the reasons we uh, developed the Washington Library is to emphasize the fact that Washington was a lifelong learner. And, and what's the best book that captures the essence of Washington, not just um, from the historical facts of as things happened in his life, but more, more how you're telling the story of who Washington was. And is there, have you ever seen a screen or movie 
version that represented him well? Well, let's start with the first question on books. I'll have to give you um, three, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. But I think the easiest read, beautifully written, is by Joseph Ellis, and it's called His Excellency. Um, and it really portrays him as a human being and gives you some of that flavor, but he does it in a way which shows how important, how he developed his credibility, how he became more modest over time, how he, you know, controlled that ambition so it wasn't on the surface pounding other people in the nose. Um, it was interesting. Um, and it shows his humanity as well, which I think is, is important. Um, the other, another one I would recommend is The Return of George Washington by Ed Lingell. And that book really talks about that period of time between the end of the Constitutional Convention, excuse me, the end of the, con of the Continental Congress, all the way up through the Constitutional Convention and into Washington's first term in office. Um, that's a period of time, which as I mentioned in my opening comments, I think we don't think enough about. Um, there's another one that I like, which I think is, uh, is, well, there are a couple of others, but another one that I think is fun that's often overlooked, it's called The Eye of the Hurricane. Um, and, um, and that's by a guy named Philbrook. Uh, and it shows Washington's understanding of the interplay between the seacoast and, and military warfare. So I think th those, those are good books. All right, thank you. And we'll get to some audience questions now. Okay. Thank you, Jewel and Jorn and, and Janine and Tova. Great questions. And Admiral Cressy, thank you so much for, for all your great answers and spending time with us today. We want to give a shout out to the students who are watching today that have let us know that they're on. Uh, Donna Vitek is on and Deanna Pickle Picklesheimer is on. And Kimberly Hammers has 30 students from Grassfield High School that are on. And Teresa Kukla has 36 students at Tabernacle School who are on. So welcome to all the students and we encourage our students to, to put your questions into the Q&A. And Deanna, one of our students, does have a question, uh, Admiral Cressy. And if you don't have this memorized, don't worry. But um, Deanna asks, how old was George Washington when he became general and then when he became president? Do you? Well, yeah, sure, I can do that. Let me back it up just a little bit. So he died in 1799, and he was 67 years old. Um, and he had been two years retired from the presidency. So we can, we can take a total of 10 years off of, of 1799. So remember, he's elected in, in um, 1789 or 1788 and becomes president in 1789. Now, there's a four year stretch between the end of the war in 83. And so we've got four years there. He assumes command actually in 1775, right? So he got 1775 to 1783. We've got eight years plus four. So let's take another 12 years um, uh, off of that, that first figure. And that'll give you his, um, that'll give you how old he was when he took over in the battle, I think, what, roughly, what, 48, something like that. Yeah, and that's, that'll be a great math project for the students to take those numbers and figure it out. So thank you for that. And uh, I wanted to read a comment from um, Bradley Bo Bowditch. Bradley says, I really feel like Washington is too underrated in our founding uh, pantheon, which is a, a really interesting comment. And then James Manship uh, has a book to suggest. He says, renew learning of Washington's rules of civility would be a start to restoring a civil heir for America. 
Um, do you want to, do you know about Washington's rules of civility? Well, yeah, they're actually Jesuit rules. There was a, they were called the rules of civility. I believe there were a hundred and maybe the student can correct me about, about 150, maybe it was 139. I can't remember exactly, but it was, um, and it, excuse me, ladies, it was in those days, it was how to be a gentleman, right? But it refers to everybody. Um, and it was, and it was things like don't yawn in somebody's face. Uh, don't spit in public and, 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 you know, never be angry at somebody. I mean, very, and he copied these things as a part of teaching himself good penmanship. He had absolutely beautiful penmanship, which he learned from copying those rules of civility. And I think those rules were first drafted in the 1500s by a Jesuit priest, interestingly enough. Um, so that was, what was the other question, Kathy? The other comment, the first one. Uh, they felt that um, George Washington is, is underrated um, when you study the founders. Well, you know, <clears throat> I think there was a period of time when that was probably true, but I think um, recent literature, I mean, Hamilton, you know, it's called Hamilton, really focuses a lot of attention on Washington. Um, uh, Ron Chernow's book called A Life about George Washington is extraordinary. He's the same guy who wrote the book Hamilton. And actually his book on Washington is better. He's a better writer at that point. Um, I think this happens because for a long time there was this, this, this wonderful view of, of, of Jefferson. And I think that importantly, um, you know, we've begun to recognize that Jefferson was a very great writer and was a great philosopher. Um, on the other hand, Washington always walks the talk. Um, and I think a very important thing to say is that Washington is the only Southern founding father who frees his slaves and takes this very seriously. Not only does he come to realize that this is an absolute necessity, uh, that it's an immoral uh, institution, that we need to fix it, but he goes beyond that, Kathy. He makes the decision to turn his river farm into tenant farms, tries to hire a tenant farmer from England, and unfortunately he dies before he gets all that done. But he is he's a man who learns as he goes. And, and I think that now that book by Joseph Ellis, which I mentioned, The Indispensable Man, makes the point that without him as the rock, he was the living legend of the time. And he was smart enough to recognize that he was perceived that way. And he was careful to act appropriately so that he would not tarnish that early image of the United States and the presidency. Yeah, his, his vision was just incredible how he could see just the big picture. Um, and we'll close with this question from Dr. Rick Mayberry. Uh, Dr. Mayberry writes, so many of his behaviors of Washington set the standards and principles for our republic. For example, giving up power as you shared, and also consistently he deferred decision-making to Congress because he believed that the government should be of the people and not the leading military authority. Can you think of other behaviors that inherently led to the values and policies of the American democratic system as we view it today? This concept alone would make for a great study and book providing valuable civics lessons. Well, of course, the one that jumps out is his insistence on civility, that you had to respect each other. Uh, nothing was gained by angry rhetoric, um, that people had to control themselves. Uh, he learned extraordinary individual self-control. And when I'm teaching leadership, I always teach, I always emphasize to leaders that the leader should not be the problem. Your temper, uh, your behavior should not be the problem. You as a leader have always got to be the one who's the most considerate, the most understanding of what everybody is, is facing. Human perception, uh, human kindness, um, I think is, is critically important to Washington. His, his notion of integrity, I mentioned before, 
it wasn't just integrity every day in the office, but he felt like this country had to pay its debt to the Dutch people and the French people who had bought bonds. When he, when, when he came into office, the bonds were worth 30 cents on a dollar. When he left, they were worth a dollar and 15 cents. Paid back our debts. Um, that if people can't be trusted, nothing can be done. I mean, you can't have a democracy if there isn't trust. How, how can you have it? You can't have a democracy if there isn't civility, if there isn't respect, if there isn't a sense of compromise. And when we look at some of the great collaborations of Washington's time, um, I think it's just extraordinary what he, you know, what he did. And I think, I think those pieces are absolutely important. And he respected the Congress, he respected the judiciary, um, but he expected everybody to be civil to each other um, and, to, and to be appropriate in their behavior. So I think that's important. Well, thank you. And that's a great way to end it. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour. And we just thank you so much for your time today. Could I, Janine? Could I, could I just have a, a few yeah. words to close with? Uh, Admiral, you've been amazing today. And thank you so much uh, for this wonderful opportunity to hear you as Jewel and Joran were saying, you're such a, a, a fabulous storyteller. And and thank you for relaying all of George Washington's not only great accomplishments, but his sense of humanity. And, and as I listen to you talk about how he learned to control himself, it's, it's funny because I do know he had a temper and he had to learn how to control that temper. And that makes me feel better in the respect that it's great to know that these great leaders are not, um, you know, that, that they, they do have obstacles that they have to learn to master. And Absolutely. so he did learn, he did learn to master that. And also just, I, I read Ron Chernow's book, which I thought was amazing. And one of the things I learned, and, and I just wanted to share this about George Washington, is how difficult things were for him and how he did get so depressed and just didn't know how he was going to continue on. And generals were trying, his own generals were trying to take him down and and, and the way people would attack him and Valley Forge alone and not being able to get food or clothing and how he persevered, how right. he just did not give up before that miracle, I think is one of the greatest legacies of George Washington. And then I just want to close with the story of the cherry tree. We know that that's not a true story, but I love it. And what I would always tell my daughter about, you know, George Washington, you know, his father said, did you chop down the cherry tree? Is that George Washington in this, in this, in this fable that explains him so well is that he said, yes, I did chop down the cherry tree. And the reason, even though it's not true, I think it's so applicable to George Washington is I always tell my daughter, telling the truth isn't always easy. If telling the truth were easy, then, you know, it would be, but telling the truth isn't easy. So telling the truth, knowing that you have repercussions for that truth is honor and is character. And even though he knew his father would be upset, he still told the truth. And I just think all those things really sum up George Washington in, in a way that that just, I don't know, I, I find to be a, a, great, a great inspiration. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Admiral Cressy. And, and thank you, Janine, for the closing comments. And we want to thank our audience for being with us and invite y'all back next week as we start a new series called National Security, the Constitution, and You. And next week on Tuesday, February 28th, we're going to start out by taking a look at China in an episode called TikTok Balloons in China, What You Should Know. So we're really excited for I've that. I've really wanted to do this study. I'm very excited about this study. I'm very excited that we're going to talk about TikTok and delve down into the deep recesses of why exactly it's bad. So I'm excited. So y'all uh, come back next week and thank you again and happy Washington's birthday tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye.